Hello and welcome back to a new session from the teaching series entitled The Glory of Righteousness. Today we'll continue to talk about who are you in the Spirit. We are in the second big chapter of this series of teaching that is entitled Cleansing the Conscious of Sins. And in this session, we'll continue the discussion started in the last session, if you remember, about who you are in the Spirit. If you remember, I had given a first diagram with three concentric circles that represented the body, the soul, and the Spirit, and the relationships between them. And today I will present a second diagram of three rings in a row, like a chain, which also illustrates the lack of a direct link between the spirit and the body. That's why everything that comes out from your spirit into your body must go through your mental, emotional part. A third significant diagram is the diagram of the pipes, where one side of the pipe represents your spirit and the other side your body. And your soul acts as a valve in, in between the two. When you open the valve, what's in your spirit can flow through your body, through your soul to your body. And depending upon, upon how open it is, the flow of life can be just a trickle, a small stream, or rivers, like John 7, 38 says. But when the valve is closed, the flow from the spirit to body shuts off. That's a great illustration of how a born-again believer functions. The spirit is encapsulated inside the soul and it doesn't have direct access to the physical body. It has to go through the soul. Romans 8.11 says that the same spirit and the same power that raised Jesus from the dead already indwells every born-again believer. But if your mind is close to this truth and it doesn't embrace it, that resurrection life cannot flow through you. If what you see in the spiritual mirror doesn't become more real to your mind than what you see in the physical realm, then it's possible for this resurrection life that is in your spirit to be completely shut off and made of no effect. Just like you would shut the valve to a pipe. You can get to a point where you are totally dominated by what you feel and you say something like this. But I feel sick. My body hurts. The doctor says I'm dying. Here's my medical record. And if those things dominate you, then even though you have the raising from the dead life of God in your spirit, your soul can shut off that power so that not one drop of God's life-giving power ever touches your physical body. And you can die sick, and that's sad, having the resurrection life of God on the inside of you. It will be like dying of thirst while leaning against a well full of life-giving water. And of course, you can apply that to every area of your life. You can have depression, you can have anger and bitterness in you, when the whole time in your spirit there is love, joy, and peace. So the critical part in releasing the resurrection life is your soul. Your spirit is always for God. It's always on God's side, always like God. And it has everything in it that God has. Your body is really neither good nor bad. It's not moral or immoral. It's amoral. Your body doesn't really dictate or control anything. Your soul is the one controlling what happens to your body. Your spirit is always for God and your body is going to go with the flow. If the soul doesn't influence it, then your body is going to go by just what it sees, tastes, hears, smells, or feels. On one hand, if you get your soul in agreement with your spirit, then it's two entities fighting alongside against the physical one, and the life of God that is in your spirit will manifest itself in your physical body much quicker and easier. It will produce healing, deliverance, victory, and power. On the other hand, if your soul gets in agreement with what your physical body sense, uh, senses to the point that you cannot believe anything that you cannot perceive with your five senses, then you will shut off the life of God that is in your spirit. It's sad to say this, but this is where a large numbers, a number of Christians are today. And the major reason for this state of things is because most Christians don't have a functional working revelation of spirit, soul, and body. 
they really don't understand that a radical change has already happened in their spirit and they are not fully aware of who they are in Christ, thinking that if they cannot see, taste, hear, smell, or feel something, then it's not real. Their intention is not to be liars or hypocrites by ignoring their senses. They are just trying to be real and honest, and I know that. They search their physical and emotional realm, and if they cannot perceive in some way or another the power of God with their five senses, then they think, well, it's not here. But the truth is that if you have made Jesus your Lord, there was a change that took place inside of you. You became a brand new you. All things passed away. All things have become new. And this is the beginning place of victory in your relationship with the Lord. I cannot overstate enough how important this understanding is. What this did to me, for me, is that it transformed my life and my thinking because I have experienced from time to time the power of God in reality at my physical and emotional level like you probably did too from time to time. But after the emotion of that power wore off, I thought that it was gone. I knew that God was real and all the things that he promised were real, but I didn't think that they were in me. And because of that, I went through periods of frustration, desperation, and discouragement, not because of sin, but because of the desire to live for God and experience his best, like you probably have it. I felt like I could not get there. And this happens a lot with many Christians that experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit at one time. They receive the power and then because they don't feel anything in their bodies anymore, they believe it's gone or that they have to wait and pray again for it or that they have to sanctify themselves and fast to get it. But all the while the power is there. It just needs to be stirred up and activated by mind renewal, worship, and praying in tongues. In your born-again spirit, you already have all the power of God. It's just a matter of releasing what you have, not going and trying to get something from God. This concept revolutionized my life, and I hope it will do the same for your life. Once you are born again, the Christian life is not a process of getting things from God, but rather a process of renewing the mind to where you just learn to release what you have already received. It's so much easier to release something that you already have received rather than trying to get something that you don't have. The process of attempting to get something that you don't have it's, and it's not a reality for you yet, it already has an element of doubt in it. In other words, you believe it's possible, but you don't believe that it's already a done deal reality. Your perspective is one of trying to head towards it, to start believing God for healing, for joy, for victory, for power, for prosperity, and for holiness. And this perspective has already an element of doubt in it. You believe it's possible, but you don't believe it's already done for you and in you. But once you believe it's already done, how can you doubt that you are going to get something that you already have? In practice, you don't doubt that you'll get a car if you already have it, right? Likewise, a job or a house, right? And I know that some of you are thinking, well, of course, you don't doubt. Why would you doubt that you are going to get something that you already have? Well, that's the point that I'm making. I'm trying to make an illustration here. In the natural, we don't do that. If you already got it, you don't doubt that you will get it. But if you say something like this along these lines, I'm believing God for my healing. And then you start struggling and saying, I cast down the, that thought of doubt. I believe that I'm going to receive. God is going to heal me. I will receive my miracle from God. You are in the same situation. One of the reasons why you doubt is that you don't believe you've already got the healing. 
in Jesus' sacrifice, once with the whole salvation. You believe you can get it, but you don't believe you do have it already. This is exactly what happened at the moment of salvation, which will further emphasize my point. When I confessed Jesus is my Lord, I was instantly changed and my spirit became totally brand new. My spirit is not in the process of changing, is not growing up, is not maturing. In my spirit, I am total and complete and the rest of the Christian life is not learning how to get from God, but it's rather learning how to release the life that He has already placed in me instantaneously and in abundance through that new birth. What a radical truth. Let's read Philemon 1.6 where it says the following. That the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. The word sharing in this verse means to release and to transfer. So the release of your faith becomes effective or active or effectual. Or faith begins to work and to be productive when you start acknowledging every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. Paul didn't say that your faith begins to work by getting a new anointing from God, a double portion, or from getting more of God, more of you, like, like the songs of worship that we know. Those are concepts that you will hear often, but the truth is that not a, it's not a New Testament reality. You will hear people say things like, in the Old Testament, Elisha had a double portion of what Elijah had. This is the double portion night. Come on, people, we are going to pray for you to get twice as much from God. That is an Old Testament principle. Elijah and Elisha were not born again. They didn't have the Holy Spirit in them without measure and the fullness of God in them like we do. They had the Spirit over them in small portions and for a short time. That's why Elisha could have twice as much as Elijah. But in the New Testament, the scripture says in John 1 verse 16 that, uh, let's read it together, and of his fullness... We have all received and grace for grace or grace upon grace. Moreover, Colossians 2 verses 9 to 10 says that we are complete in him in whom dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. Read, let's read this verse 2. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Then John 3.34 and John 20 verse 21 say the following. John 3.34 For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God doesn't give him the Spirit by measure. And John 20 verse 21 says this, So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. In the same way God sent His Son Jesus, having the Spirit without measure, He sent us. In the New Testament, you don't just get a little bit of God and somebody else has a little bit more of God. The truth is that every born-again believer became totally brand new. All things have passed away and all things became new. In our spirit, we are identical to one another as believers. We all receive the same measure of faith. We all receive the same power, the same wisdom, and the same ability. Our spirits are all identical to the Lord Jesus Christ in every way. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says this, But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Your spirit has become one spirit with the Lord. Your spirit is not in the process of growing and becoming better. You have already have everything. The way your faith becomes effectual in your Christian life is by acknowledging the good things that God has given you in your spirit. Even that word acknowledge is important. You cannot acknowledge something that is not a reality yet. You can only acknowledge things that already exist. Your faith begins to work when you acknowledge, when you recognize that all of these great things already exist in you in Christ Jesus. You are in Christ and Christ is in you. Again, most people have the concept that God can do anything. Christians who receive salvation by faith in Jesus Christ believe they have access to God and they have. 
and that through their prayers, God can release his power to them. But they believe it's conditional on a lot of things. Holiness, prayer, fasting, study of the words, etc., etc. They believe something along these lines. Even though God has that power and it's available to us, it's conditional on us doing a lot of things to have it come to us. Those doubts and conditions keep them from really experiencing the power of God. We believe that God has the power, but we don't believe that it's already in us. We believe that it's out there and we have to do things to obtain it or to earn it. But when I start believing that it's already a reality in my spirit, it will be easier for me to flow and release God's life. At the moment of salvation, God put his same power and anointing, his victory, his joy and his peace in me. His everything is already in me in abundance. And the only reason it doesn't manifest itself in my emotions or my physical body is not because God didn't give it to me, but because of an unrenewed mind. I'm still looking in a physical mirror instead of looking in the spiritual mirror of the world. One third of your salvation is already complete. Your spirit is as saved, as sanctified, as holy, as empowered as it will ever be throughout all eternity, if I could say that. You will get a new body and your soul will be fully renewed, but your spirit will not improve in any way. Your current spirit will accompany you throughout eternity. Your soul and body are in the process of change and at the second coming of the Lord, your body and soul will be completely changed as well. All three will be perfect at that time. But right now, your spirit is as perfect and as complete as it will ever be And the rest of the Christian life is a process of renewing your mind. And as you do that, the physical body will experience the benefits too. Let's read Ephesians 4, 20-24 and see how is this new spirit created at the new birth. But you haven't so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off Concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Verse 24 says to put on the new man, that new birth, the spirit part of you, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Did you know that when you were born physically, you didn't start to exist and then 10 years later you became a real person? You were already a person from the moment of inception. You were created that way. Likewise, when you got born again, you were created as the righteousness of God in Him. You were created righteous and truly holy. This is not pride, but confidence and faith in what God said, and that is ultimately true humility. Agreeing with what God said about you and not having your own better opinion based on how you feel. Most Christians have this concept that they are becoming righteous in time and that they are getting holier by the day. But what they refer to is their actions and their behavior. They are looking on the outward physical realm and it's true that Christians vary in their actions, vary in the degree of morality that they live outwardly. But in their spirit, they were created righteous and truly holy. And this is so vital. John 4.24 says this, and probably some of you know this, uh, this passage. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. This verse didn't say that you might worship in spirit and truth, or that you should worship that, that way because that is preferable. No, it said that you must worship him in spirit and truth. Why is that? Because when you get born again, your spirit is completely changed and is instantly recreated righteous. If you don't understand this and approach God based on how you're acting in your physical body or, and on how your thought life is at that moment, you are not worthy to come into His presence, even at your very best performance. 
you are still failing short of doing everything that you should. Even when you are at your best state emotionally and you've, you've been seeking God and you still have negative thoughts and things in your mind that are impure and God is holy. So how can a holy God fellowship with unholy people? Even at your very best spiritually, you still fall short of God's standards and perfection. When you put your faith in Jesus and become born again, your spirit becomes a brand new creature that is righteous and holy and able to fellowship with God and worship a holy God. You are as pure and as holy in your spirit as Jesus is because it's his righteousness that has been given unto you. In 1 Corinthians 1.30, it says this, But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Jesus has become our righteousness. Praise God. What a radical truth. When a person says, all my righteousness is as filthy rags. That's a quotation from Isaiah 64 verse 6. It's true that in the Old Testament, your righteousness was as filthy rags. But you're not in the Old Testament anymore. The Old Testament people were not born again. They didn't have a new spirit that was created in righteousness and true holiness. Regardless of how good they lived in their physical body and kept the law and in their soulish mind, they still came short of the glory of God, as it is said in Romans 3.23. All of us have. So if you're just looking at the physical, natural, outward part of you, all of your righteousness is like a filthy rag. That's true. But when you get born again, you are no longer just physical and you are no longer short of the glory of God. The glory that Jesus had, he has given it to us. John 17 verse 22 says that. This is the whole point I'm trying to get across to you. In the spirit, you are a brand new person, a new species that never existed before. For a New Testament believer to say that his or her righteousness is like filthy rags is no longer accurate. It's not the present truth. In a sense, it would be like calling Jesus a filthy rag, right? Because Jesus has become your righteousness. Now, it's true that in your physical realm, you need to improve your actions. Don't neglect those, those emotions and thoughts in holiness. But in that realm, you are always in a process. You will never arrive. You just head into that direction and you have a growing victory. But in the spirit, you are not in a process of becoming righteous. You are already created righteous and truly holy. Otherwise, you couldn't worship God. And since God is a spirit, John 40, 24, and he looks at your spirit and relates to you based on your spirit status, this is the reason that you must worship him in spirit and in the truth about your spirit. You must believe the realities about your spirit and the truth about your spirit revealed in the word when you approach God. That's the only way God can accept you. According to John 1 verses 12 to 13, the new creation is born of God himself and not of blood or flesh. That can happen only at the spirit level. Let's read this passage together. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Then in 1 John 4, 17, the Bible says this. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Notice that this passage didn't say that as he is, so are we going to be in the next world. But so are we in this world. If you look into a physical mirror, you might see wrinkles, baldness, bulges, and all kinds of things. And then start wondering, am I really like Jesus is? You know Jesus is not like that. Then you search your emotional realm and find out that you have depression, discouragement, anger, and bitterness. If you look just at your emotional realm and try to reconcile that with 1 John 4, 17, you'll probably come to a place where you'll say, the Bible is so hard to understand and I, I just can't understand what it means. 
Anybody can tell by just looking at me that I'm not as Jesus is. So you move into unbelief and you let your senses continue to dominate you. But if you understand spirit, soul and body and understand that this is your spirit that is talking about, this is the only way that you can be as Jesus is right now in this world. So today we ended the discussion about who you are in the spirit and in the next session we will discuss the mind renewal process and the mirror principle principle that i touched a little bit on but until next time may god fill you with the fullness of his joy amen